Welcome back to Making the Case. Now, let's talk about that disturbing case out of Florida with an understanding from a broader context of police violence against black children. In Lee County, Florida, a 16 year old by the name of Jack Rodeman was tased by a state trooper who claims he was acting suspiciously. Incidents of police violence against black children are far from us unusual, that is. Joining me tonight to discuss is Akia Sankara Jabbar. She's the director of activism and founder of Racial Justice Now. Zakia, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Now, what were your thoughts when you first saw this video with 16-year-old Jack Rodeman? As a mother, uh, I felt a combination of fear uh, and anger. Uh, I was angry uh, that this child uh, was being treated this way by this uh, person in law enforcement. Um, and I was also fearful that this police officer would actually uh, take his life. Um, so my heart certainly goes out to uh, both this young man and his mother. Now, how is this incident similar to others involving police violence against black children and, and whether there's anything that makes it unusual? Yes, yeah, unfortunately, um, very consistent. Uh, law enforcement uh, in our schools um, have been wreaking havoc uh, for decades uh, with the advent of the smartphone. However, the last several years, uh, unfortunately, we have been able to see video of young black women and young men um, being harmed uh, by uh, law enforcement. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, organizations across this country uh, with the support of, of, of activists in the field that we support uh, in cities across this country is Brightbeam are calling for police free schools. This is a prime example uh, this law enforcement mm -hmm. officer, from what I saw in the video, uh, gave no grace to this young man. He didn't even allow him to respond before he administered his taser. It's sort of this idea of shoot first and ask questions later when it comes to black children. Now, let's talk about um, your organization, Racial Justice Now. Tell us about the work that you're doing and, and, it, and its particular relevance, that is, to what we're going through as a country right now. Absolutely. Racial Justice Now was founded uh, out, of, out of my own experience with my own son. Uh, he was three years old at the time. Uh, and so we're, we're one of the organizations that's fighting the school to prison pipeline, um, pushing back on this overly punitive uh, system that targets black children and targets also their parents. So that's one of the things that we have to continue to do is support black parents and black children together because there's it's almost like a package deal. Parents are disrespected in our schools and children are certainly de dehumanized uh, in our schools. And one of the things that we are doing uh, basically here in Maryland and in Ohio is pushing for laws and policies that would decriminalize uh, parents and students. Now, we often talk about the, you mentioned it, the school to prison pipeline. Talk to me specifically about how we can work as a country to end that pipeline. We have to. Uh, it's unfortunate that this country has not, um, in many places, has not, you know, did enough to end the school to prison pipeline. In fact, even during COVID, you heard of the police being called on young people at home. A young black man in Colorado had the police called on him while he's sitting at home in front of a computer uh, because of a toy gun in the background. So there's a lot that needs to happen when it comes to teacher diversity, which is a huge issue. Um, upwards of 75% of teachers in this country are white women. Um, they tend to you know, see trouble when they look at our children for some reason. Um, and then, then the other piece is, is that we don't have policies uh, and procedures that's catching up with making sure that all children are created equitably in our schools. Now, Zaki, can you expound, because you mentioned it earlier in one of your previous responses, but can you expound more on how the presence of police in schools contribute to police violence against black children? 
Absolutely. <laughs> There's so many studies out there. I mean, the police violence and the presence of law enforcement increases the likelihood that black children and also some other children of color will end up in the juvenile justice system, literally the school to prison pipeline, which is why organizations like Racial Justice Now, the National Dignity in Schools campaign and others have been fighting all across this country from Oakland, California to here in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, to remove the presence of law enforcement in schools. We believe, you know, that there are so many other things that could be done to ensure a safe environment for teachers, for students, and all staff. Uh, and that does not include the police. The other thing that I want to say here is that having law enforcement in schools um, is pretty recent. I would, within the last 30 uh, uh, or 20 to 25 to 30 years, when I was in high school, I did not have a law enforcement officer in school. Um, many people that I know that also in my same age bracket did not have a police officer in school. Uh, so we, what we were doing before to ensure schools were safe is what we can do again uh, to ensure mm -hmm. that schools are safe. And finally, uh, really quickly, because I think, you know, there are going to be listeners that are going to be like, well, you know, there's more school shootings. Here's the deal. There's mm -hmm. research that's showing that law enforcement actually being in schools does not prevent school shootings. What actually does prevent uh, young people from feeling like they have to do something so drastic like that is to make sure that they have relationships built on trust, um, restorative practices, restorative justice. There's so many things that could be done in schools to ensure that they're really safe. Law enforcement and police do not equal safety, especially for black people. Now, we spoke to, well, we tried to at least initially um, with Jack Rodeman and uh, his mother about the importance of, I wanted to ask them about the importance um, of conversations that we need to have with our black and brown children um, about, you know, interactions with law enforcement. How important is it that parents have that conversation? And for those parents who don't necessarily know how, do you have any, you know, advice? It's unfortunate, but we have to. Uh, I am a mother of a young black son who was 13, was taller than me. I also have a daughter. So this uh, conversation is something that's necessary, even though it still may not prevent something horribly um, happening to them. It's still uh, necessary from my perspective to ensure, you know, that these young people, especially our sons, um, have have the etiquette, if you will, uh, on how to deal with the police, um, especially young people. I think about like the Central Park Five, not doing a whole lot of talking, right? Like making sure you're mm -hmm. saying, I like to have my parents here. I like to have my lawyer here. My mom and my dad said not to talk until you call them. <laughs> so my son mm -hmm. knows the drill. Right. Um, so we want to make sure that children are not only, you know, not talking to police so that they don't end up like the Central Park Five, you know, out of fear and pressure, admitting to something that they didn't even do. Um, but then we also want to make sure that they stay alive. Zakia Sankara Jabbar, director of activism and founder of Racial Justice Now. Thank you again for joining me. Thank you so much. Take care.